Minnesota's Hispanics, an inadequate term for peoples who carry identities from Spanish, Caribbean, Portuguese, Mestizo, African, Native American, Mexican, Central and South American traditions. Their stories of life here are sometimes new and sometimes as old as the century. Stories of transience, but not of leaving behind. Strengthened by the powerful gift of common language, cultures have been carried and passed on. Traditions blended together, common and distinctive. Here they find a voice in a different language, making a place in this sometimes hostile climate. These are the stories of people for whom Minnesota is home. Like many immigrants to Minnesota before and after them, many people of Hispanic heritage first began their association with the state through agriculture. Since early in the century, Mexican-American workers have labored in the state's fields and then moved on when the work was done. Every summer, still hundreds of families travel from Texas, some to live in camps like this one near Owatonna. Here they farm a succession of crops, from planting to harvesting. I came here from far away to make more money, and to learn more about the world, see other places, get to know many beautiful places. A rich person might go to see a place, and that's it. But for others, who don't have those possibilities, you come to work and at the same time you get to travel. Martin Aguilera is one of the thousands of Mexican-American migrant workers who come to the state every summer. They contribute a steady source of cheap labor that produces the food that has made this area a part of the nation's breadbasket. Coming from an area where even cheaper labor is commonplace, traveling north is the way they survive. I live on the border between La Paz and Piedras Negras, and there's no work there, because a lot of people live in Mexico and come to the United States every day. But since they live in Mexico and everything is much cheaper there, they come across the border and work not just for minimum wage, but sometimes for even less. And that's why we come, because we all have the same problem. Since it's near the border, there's no work. And as long as they keep treating us well here, keep helping us, I think we'll keep on coming until who knows when. Martin has been coming to Minnesota for eight years and says he likes coming here because jobs are plentiful and help in getting started is available. Even in mid-October, while the harvesting of these pumpkins provides fewer jobs in the fields, canning plants continue to hire migrant workers into the winter. There are simply a lot of jobs here. There are a lot of companies. I just went to Worthington. There are three companies there that have jobs open. It's just temporary work. But there is work year-long, if you want it. And increasingly, migrants are staying in Minnesota for even low-paying temporary work. A bad economy in Texas has left many with little to return to. And larger families, once able to work as units in the fields, are finding the migrant life more of a constant financial struggle. Today's migrant workers bridge a lifestyle that may be changing. Though Martin Aguilera says he enjoys migrant work and will stick with it, his advice for young people is to find another way. I like this life. It's hard, but ever since I was a kid, it's been like this. Things have turned out well for me. I already let all that happen, but I like this life. I would tell any young person in school that they should grab every opportunity that they get. The changes that have come with time have affected migrant farmers and Minnesota communities in other subtle and less subtle ways. Fargo-Moorhead is in the heart of the Red River Valley, where sugar beets are the cash crop. 
Farm owners here have employed migrants for years, but have stopped providing housing on their property. That has moved more laborers, along with increasing numbers of Hispanics who have decided to settle into the town to live. Do you have any um, Hispanics living in your neighborhood? Oh yeah, yeah, there's, there's some out there. And have you had any problems with that, or? Yeah, it seems like they come on, they come on this area, and they think they can get by with anything. They don't abide by the laws or anything. This is an issue in, especially in this area. I think that they think that the Hispanics are just going to go away, and we're not. Josie Gonzalez works with migrants as a financial assistance worker for county social services in Moorhead. She's seen the changes that have fed some of the damaging attitudes. The migrants were kept out of sight, out of mind. They weren't the next door neighbors of our, of our residents in Moorhead. Um, but now they're their neighbors, and it's very hard for them to deal with with uh, migrants being their neighbors. Migrants are Josie's neighbors too, and that is as new to her as to any other Moorhead resident. She and her husband Al have spent most of their lives in northwestern Minnesota and have lived in Moorhead for 12 years. They've raised a family here. Dinner at Grandma's is just a short drive away. They have worked hard to make it in the community. Thank God, you know, we've been able to give our kids, you know, food on the table and a home, and, and um, they haven't suffered at all. They haven't gone hungry. We have had to work very, very hard, and we've had to suffer. We, but we've come from the traditional school where, you know, we, had to, we broke out of the fields and into this, and, and we want them to learn, you know, that, that they don't have to go through hardships. Theirs is a family that has settled into a comfortable life. Al brings the world to Fargo-Moorhead as press operator for the Fargo Forum. And he and Josie have made a home for their three teenage daughters and Josie's sister. Their lives have turned out better than they could have expected when they met 20 years ago in the Crookston area. I met her to a brother of him. You know, I used to go to their house and, and I got for, you know, we got to be friends, and I got to be friends with our family. And one thing led to another. And, and, and here, you know, that's, we, I remember asking her, her dad, I wanted to get married, and her dad wouldn't let her, because she was too young, which now I can understand, but in that time, you know, because I got young girls now, I wouldn't want them to get married. <laughs> I remember when he brought his mother to, to ask for, for my hand, my dad, we used to live at the migrant house, and it was in the summer, and, and he brought his mother to the farm, and she comes in the front door in the kitchen, and he takes off the other door, and he's putting on his shoes to leave because he doesn't want to deal with this. He does not want to have this conversation. She goes up, and she goes, you, don't you go, Luis. You're the one that I want to talk to, senor. Come back here, you know. So here, my dad's coming back real like, well, okay, we have to have this conversation. I knew it was coming, you know, can't they wait a little bit, you know? And so we ended up, we ended up getting married that October. And, and then, um, then we um, took his, his mom and his brother back to Laredo and we stayed here. Both Josie and Al's earliest experiences echo those of other Mexican-Americans who knew field work before practically anything else. My dad trained me. He took me to the field when I was 11, and he put me in front of his roll, and he said, this is how you hold beats. And he'd, he'd make me work a little space, and then um, you know, he'd check my work, and I'd be in the same role that he was in, and he'd check my work, and he'd tell me how I was doing, and he'd put me up a little bit, you know, like... Uh, kind of 20 feet ahead of him and he'd give me a little spot and he'd catch up with me and check my work and that's how I learned to work in the fields and you know since I was 11. But circumstances forced both Josie and Al to break from the migrant life when they were very young. Josie's family couldn't afford to move back to Texas after the migrant house in which they lived burned to the ground. At 14, Josie was taken out of school to babysit her younger brothers and sisters. While Josie's family couldn't go back, Al's family couldn't stay in Texas. His family was poor, 
and could barely get by during their winters in a barrio of Laredo. His father died young. One of his brothers was shot and killed. His mother decided to pull up stakes and chance a better future for her children in Minnesota. My mom decided that she didn't want to stay in Laredo anymore because she wanted to pull me out of the, the, the barrio because it was, it, is, it was bad. And, and I guess now as I look back, you know, in that time I didn't appreciate, I, I always thought, well, I wanted to go back there where I was from. But now that I, that I look back, I say, well, she, she did the right thing. You know. Though Al eventually got his first job working for the Crookston newspaper, easing into the Minnesota mainstream was at a cost. Part of the pain in settling in Minnesota was leaving behind extended families that had been great sources of support for both of them. While very young, Josie spent many years at the feet of her grandfather, who recently died. His grandfather rode with Pancho Villa in the Mexican Revolution, and he carried on the tradition as town constable in Littlefield, Texas. The majority of his life, he was always protecting people or working in that field or, or helping people, or, you know, um, in the form of either being a peace officer, a constable, a sheriff, and I took great pride in, in just coming from him. He always taught his social consciousness, you know, that you always need to be conscious of other, conscious of other people's needs and um, helping other people and always always you know fighting for rights you know for justice and and when he died I think we all felt it but my my loss was that there was that that foundation that that substance that I got from him was gone and I, you know, will, will we be able to survive without my grandpa? Because he was like the cornerstone, the foundation, and we built it up so high because there's so many of us. But when you pull that, is that are we, are we going to be able to survive? Is it going to hold up? You know, and I just like, this is where I evolved from, where I came from, and I don't know. Carrying on the fight for justice has put Josie at odds with stereotypes she and her family face on a day-to-day -day basis. That has meant a public fight against the school when it put her daughter in a program with non-English speaking migrants. It has meant confronting racism in the line at the grocery checkout. I remember there being a guy that didn't have enough money to pay. And she said, oh, just bring the money back later. And I thought, oh, what an occurrence. And then the second person that was directly in front of me um, paid with a check. She didn't check his IDs or anything. Then my card came up and she told me, you have to separate if you're going to be paying with food stamps. And I looked at her and being that I worked the food stamp program, I knew that that was like illegal to do that. And I, I looked at her and I said, I beg your pardon. Again, they were stereotyping that all Hispanics are on welfare and we all pay with food stamps. You know, it's stuff like that constant. You can, you can be the best professional and have all this education and know that, that it's ignorance, et cetera, et cetera. And then you'll go to a checkout stand and this little 16-year-old girl will ruin your day because she'll say, you know, food stamps are, you know, and just like, just degrade you and humiliate you. Like, just condescend, you just want <laughs> You know, just that kind of stuff that, that's always happening. Within that environment, Josie and Al have raised three daughters, Christina, Andrea, and Deanna, who comfortably fit in. They were raised in Moorhead, they do the normal Moorhead stuff. Most of their friends are white, but each of them must walk the difficult line between two cultures that sets them apart from each. They've been raised here, and so they don't know, you know, what it's been like for kids in Texas or what type of background they came from, so they can't identify. I'll never forget the first day Aunt Deanna came home and asked me what a spick was. Now, you know, it's like, she's my baby, so of course she was, I, what? You know, and... Someone called you a spick? Who called you a spick? 
oh, this boy called me a spick mom, and what is it? And then just explaining that it's, they call you this name um, because of the color of your skin, and it's not a nice name, it's a nasty name because you're brown. I don't like to refer to white people as white. Well, what do you call them? <laughs> <laughs> Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> I do. I don't like to because that's all I hang around. That's th those are all my friends, and I don't have very many Hispanic friends. Why? Because they don't like us. Because they don't like us. Yeah. Because they because think we are. Point. Because we are where we are. And because and, oh. we're where we are accepted in this community, mm. in this in this society here. Sometimes for the wrong reasons. Sometimes but, for the right. But um, they say we want to be white. We want to be. No, we're not. Which is not true. Which is not true, I guess. But they, because we have a, we keep our culture. I mean, we have it. It's very much alive in us. Sometimes, sometimes even more than other people. The people that don't like us, probably much more. Who don't like you? Well, the other Hispanics. We the have. Hispanics, the we others, have a lot of problems. Majority like, of the other Hispanics. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah, majority. Yeah. Yeah. Some, the majority. The majority of them don't. If they're not our relatives. They don't like they us, don't like us. <laughs> unless they really take the time to, to get, get to, to know us. us. Cause they think so just because we associate and hang around with, sorry, Christina, white, white people, people. <laughs> <laughs> that we we don't we don't want to be Hispanic and that we we deny that we're Hispanic and that we don't want to be and all that. I hung around with a Hispanic girl last year. At, I had a lot of fun. It was lots of fun. And, and I miss that. that Dre gets this little flare in her like. That was. <laughs> I love hanging around them because that's my culture. That's why I love Texas because I love being around Hispanics. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's why I love Texas. Well, do you like Texas, Jenna? Yeah. You like Texas, Jenna? Mm -hmm. Why, Diana? Why? Because <laughs> most of our relatives are down there. We have mo most of them are down there, and then you're right. We have a lot of our culture down there. One of the things I'm really proud of my girls is that they all stand up for a special for their heritage their, and our rich culture. They, they always defend our culture. The heritage that the Gonzalez girls carry so gracefully includes gifts of strength and passion from their mother. Josie has made waves in her career and in standing up for her children. I want my child to be treated as an individual, period. By setting herself apart, she also makes a place for her children to become part of the larger community. I guess the reason why I do what I do is for myself as a person, and I represent me, and I am Hispanic. And I feel that if a lot of people would take that role, we wouldn't have as, as, as many of the problems that we have now this is a very conservative community, and there is racism in our community. And it's sad, it's, you know, it's very sad that, you know, this is what I have to teach my kids about, the culture, too. The difficult balance that Josie and Al and their daughters must strike between being a part of the Hispanic community and being accepted in a larger community is common to many minorities. But in smaller communities, the isolation makes the task more delicate. Though migrant workers have been part of the landscape for years, places like Moorhead, Wilmer, and Rochester are still learning to make room for Hispanics and welcome them as they come and go and stay to live. <laughs>